Hi again. Um, I'm Lennart Fattering. I talked yesterday about um, SystemD, and today I'm going to um, speak specifically about containers in SystemD and how they relate. Um, I know that I speak very, very fast, and I'm sorry for that. Um, and uh, I try to speak slow, but usually during my talks I tend to forget that. So um, if I'm going too fast again in the middle of the talk, please just tell me and I'll try to slow down again. Um, yeah, so um, containers, of course, um, everybody knows what containers are, right? Like it's a, it's a hot, awesome, big thing of today. There are many implementations currently. There's uh, Docker, which is probably the most uh, famous one, there's Rocket. Oh, actually, it's not called Rocket anymore. It's now called, um, like, just lowercase RKT. There's LXC, there's Libvirt LXC, there's OpenVZ. Um, in SystemD, we have another one, uh, which is called SystemD and Spawn, in combination with something called SystemD MachineD, in combination with something called SystemD ImportD. Now, um, if, you, if you compare these implementations, of course, the first question you have to ask is, why does SystemD even have a little container manager? Like, uh, I mean, there are already so many implementations around. Why do we need another one uh, in SystemD itself? And that's absolutely a valid question, right? Um, but uh, to give an explanation, like why that happened, uh, like we add, why we added that, um, we we believe um, philo philosophically that containers are really it should be part of the OS concept itself, right? There should not be something that you add on top, but there should be something that the operating system knows about, right, from the, from on all levels of the stack, right? Um, the inspiration here, the big one, is Solaris Zones. Solaris Zones um, is, is a feature of, of the Solaris operating system. It's like 15 years old now or something. Um, Zones is just a different name for container, and they had that 15 years ago, they had this really, really deep integration of containers into the operating system. Solaris is kind of dead now, but I still believe it's a great ins in, in, in inspiration um, for, for designing an operating system. And so we thought, okay, if uh, Solaris does that, um, and uh, given that containers are really um, something where, uh, how I personally believe that an operating system should run these days, um, Maybe we should just do it in the lowest level of the of the operating system and uh, introduce like the container concept everywhere and all the tools that we have in the lower level um, uh, uh, parts of the operating system. Um, the big concept that we try to follow here is actually different from many of the other container solutions because it's actually we care that the OS running inside the container is as similar as possible to the OS running outside of the container, right? So this is diff different, for example, like, like what we try to solve here with the tools that we have in SystemD, like SystemD and Spawn. Um, what we try to solve there is really something where we basically run more or less complete operating systems inside of the containers, while Docker usually focuses on microservices where you basically run one service or so, or maybe two inside of um, each Docker container, but not more. So. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a different focus, right? Um, you, with our tool sets, we just think that, uh, well, if you develop your application for, um, for Linux, it shouldn't really matter if the application is running inside of a container or on the host, right? Um, if you look at Docker, of course, it's, it's slightly different because um, inside of the containers, you, get, um, you, you lose a lot of the functionality that the host otherwise offers, right? You cannot talk to local services and things like that, just like that. So, um, the way, um, like, like, I usually tend to call this integrated isolation because on one hand, it is isolation, right? The containers are isolated from the host. The containers are isolated from each other. Um, and they appear as if they were completely separate nodes in the, in, in, in the network. On the other uh, side, they're much more integrated than, for example, a VM would be or an actual physical machine would be. Um, in which way integrated, we'll see later in the talk. But it's basically about the fact that if you run um, multiple um, containers on the same host, you can actually reach a level of integration like you can, uh, because you have access to the file system, because you have access to the processes from the host and, and all these things. Um, yeah, so you can achieve a level of integration that's otherwise not possible and uh, make the containers and the host relatively well integrated by also isolating them out. Um, yeah, I already mentioned that. Features that the container system provides should also be available to the host system, right? Like this is, 
Um, or this actually specifically goes in the direction, like if you, if you use something like Docker, right, um, you have all these things where you can update Docker images and download Docker images. We personally believe that actually such, such functionality should not actually be specific to containers. It should be applied to the host as well, right? So um, if you download an image uh, to run it inside of a container, it should be pretty much the same way as you would download an image and run it in a VM or run it on the host, right? The distinction, like the, 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 the distinction between how you run it should not be um, have an effect on, on, on how you um, download it, right? Um, so with the stuff that we did in systemd, we tried to focus on a, on a certain set of, uh, of uh, design, like uh, there were, there were certain things that were important for us um, in the design. Um, the first one is it should be minimal, right? Like because uh, I mean, the, the, the um, implementations of container managers like LXC, which are relatively uh, complex and very comprehensive, they um, support many options for, for, for um, the same things. Like, for example, they have a couple of storage backends, and Docker has that too. For us, um, we thought, okay, we'll keep things minimal, right? We will write a minimal container manager that will run um, uh, a good uh, um, uh, selection of, of, of um, containers but it will not provide more than one implementation for each feature, right? It will only do one storage backend, it will do one whatever, and then you, it wouldn't be even be called a backend, right? Like, because it's just built in. Um, what's also very important to us is we really want to focus on getting the low-level parts right. So, I mean, we are from the Systemd project, so um, that was kind of always our thing, that we actually try to fix things properly. The, the, the other side of the medal is um, we will not be able to d deliver a lot of the features that, that uh, the other container managers provide right now simply because we still think we need to do our homework first and fix them properly. Um, yeah, we, we also care about that we don't want hacks, right? We want a clean, integrated implementation um, for everything that we do there. Um, like specifically, um, this means, for example, like many of the container managers um, support something like device virtualization, where you can pass a device node from the host into the container, and uh, we don't do that in in Nspawn. We will not we, we we will not claim that this is officially supported, simply because the Linux kernel doesn't do device virtualization, right? And it's not just about handing a, a device node through to a container. It's really it's also about enumeration, right? Like um, like what you see in Sys needs to reflect what you see in dev. And since slash sys is not virtualized, we will not claim that the device virtualization would work with our container solution. So yeah, um, specifically also um, this means for us ButterFS and not LVM, um, because we personally believe that like, if you, if you want to have a storage back and you want to be able to take snapshots, you want to be able to, to um, um, apply um, like changes and things like that, if you want to mark things read only, blah, blah, blah. Um, then all of that should be done with ButterFS because we inherently believe it's a nicer design um, and not LVM, for example, right? Um, that's a choice, of course, that might be problematic because ButterFS is not particularly stable yet. Um, but uh, we also believe, on the other end, that, um, um, that ButterFS actually, like for the feature set that it has, and the feature set that we need for, for the specific use case of containers, it's actually without uh, too much risk because I mean containers are something that that usually live for only a very short time. Containers are something um, like where you start and stop them all the time. Usually the, the containers don't actually um, store the data locally. They usually um, contact some database, external database, or some cluster file system or whatever, uh, which m means that um, if you lose a container, right, because ButterFS didn't do the right thing, that's not too much of a problem because well. Yeah, you don't lose any actual payload data. You will just lose the one container, and those you start and stop um, all the time anyway. However, actually, um, Nspawn even works without ButterFS, except that a lot of the functionality that you have with ButterFS, like snapshotting, things like that, will then not be available. Um, yeah, what's also, I kind of already mentioned this, what's really, really important to us is that um, if we do containers, we really want to make sure that if an app runs inside of a container, it has the same APIs, the same behavior from the operating system available as it would if, if it would run on the host, right? It should be an implementation detail of how the admin runs something if it's in a container or in the host, um, and the developer shouldn't really care, right? Um, specifically, this means, for example, slash temp, um, how that is cleaned up, right? On the host, 
that's usually cleaned up automatically by time, so that if you drop in a couple of temporary files and you never touch them again, that after um, a couple of days they are gone again. But uh, um, something like very superficial like that, we believe that it must be available on the host the same way as it is available in the container, right? Like we need to be able to clean that up in the container. So yeah, this is just one facet of it, right? Um, where it's not even an API really, it's, it's just a general behavior that applications expect that slash temp is cleaned up and hence we need to provide the same thing inside of the container and on the host. Um, what also is very important to us is that we actually really want to keep the doors open for alternatives. Right. Um, specifically, this means um, much of the functionality that we implemented um, with, with Nspawn specifically, um, you can actually plug any kind of container manager in and you will get very, very similar behavior. Um, how that exactly looks, we'll um, have a look in later. Um, what's also really important to us is that we really wanted to avoid defining new standards um, where there already are standards. Specifically, this could, for example, mean that um, uh, we don't define actually container form one, right? Like we don't do anything like Docker did um, where you have these layers and you download the layers and stuff like that. We said, okay, um, containers are great, but we actually should just use whatever is already there. Specifically, um, like VM images, right? VM images, like raw disk images that contain a partition table and a file system. We thought, okay, this, this is actually fine as a container image format. Let's just make a container boot that. And that's what Nspawn does, right? Like um, you, can, you can pass it either a directory um, that you want to boot or you can pass it a disk image, like a GPT or MBR disk image, and it will boot that as if it was like basically KVM, except that it's not. It's actually just a container image. Then uh, what's also important to mention is that um, for us, I mean, this is, this is actually the history of, of Nspawn, is for us, um, we test our system more regularly in containers, actually, than on, the, on, on, the, on bare metal. It's, it's why we actually wrote Nspawn in the first place, is because, I mean, we are um, init system developers, and as an init system developer, you have to test all the time if your init system actually boots, right? And if you would do that on physical hardware, we, you would have to wait a lot of time all the time because you always have to go through the bias and wait until everything's booted up again. So back then, um, we, um, when we started writing this, we thought, okay, there must be a better way. And we played around with VMs. And uh, then we realized that we probably actually want to use uh, uh, containers. And we played around with LXC, but we figured out that, oh my god, that's way too complex for us. We just want something that just works, that you can just point to a directory and we'll do the right thing. Um, and given that containerization is actually not the most complex bit in the, uh, like, not super complex, uh, we just said, okay, let's just write our own little tool that implements namespacing, C group stuff, and actually sets that up. That's Nspawn. Nspawn, since then, like, originally was this tool only for testing and building and things like that. Since then, it gained a lot of functionality, and is actually nowadays even useful for um, much more than just testing. Um, it's not sufficient to just talk about what Nspawn and the, the container stuff that we're doing is actually supposed to be. It also matters figuring out what it actually is not supposed to be, right? Where we draw the line um, between what should be in system and what shouldn't. Um, one thing I would really like to make clear, for example, here is that cluster-wide orchestration is not the focus, right? This is something that Docker and, and, and Rocket and these kind of things are really strong on. Um, but yeah, we, we, we don't want to focus on anything that um, like goes beyond the local machine, right? We want to be this container manager that just really runs container. And if you want something um, that actually orchestrates things across the network, then use something on top of it. But um, our tool will not be sufficient, right? This is a bit similar to how KVM relates to all the, the, the higher level managers like OpenStack or Libvirt or whatever they're called, where basically, um, yeah, you use KVM as the lowest level component, but then you have this big software around that will actually distribute images across the network and things like that. So, um, yeah. And, and Spawn for us is like, we, we do the low level parts. How you push that on your cloud is completely up to you. Um, yeah. So while the cluster wide orchestration stuff is not our focus and we don't want to have that in SysMD, um, it still makes a lot of sense to build it on top. And uh, Rocket is actually one of those examples where they did that, right? The Rocket Container Manager, what, the, the thing that CoreOS came up with, is actually they use Nspawn as the actual backend, and then they build all the orchestration stuff around all the, the, the downloading of the images and things like that. 
So, um, and we li love that because it's basically, yeah, we just do, do the low level operating system integration and they do all the complex stuff um, with, with actual VAC technology on top. So, um, so much about a little bit about the background of what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it and what's important to us and what's not important to us. Um, now let's actually have a look um, on, the, on the various components um, that the container support in systemd entails. This first thing I would like to talk about is uh, machinedd. Machinedd is a, is a small daemon that runs um, on systemd systems. It's usually not actually running, it's only started on demand. Um, but it, what it's good for is that if there's a container running, like a container manager starts a container, then it can register that container with machinedd. And that basically enables a lot of integration into the rest of the um, operating system. There's one client command called, called machine control that you can actually use to then enumerate containers and introspect containers and things like that. Um, yeah, machine control is really just the client to machine D. Um, again, what's really important to say is that machine D is something that's completely open for, for other implementations. So any container of the M manager can register its machines with it and gets the integration. Um, into the operating system that way. And uh, a lot of the container managers actually have been uh, patched that way. Um, for example, Liverd LXC has, and LXC has, um, and things like that. And of course, um, Rocket gets it for free because um, our own tool does it too, which they build on. Um, what does this actually specifically give you as integration? Um, there are quite a few different things now. Like, for example, there's integration with system control, like all these commands that I've uh, put here on the slide, which basically allow you, like system control dash M is basically way how, I mean, I, I presume right now that you already uh, have some, uh, have come into contact with system control. System control is like this primary command that you interface, like you use to talk to systemd. It has a switch dash uppercase M. And with uh, dash uppercase M, you can actually make a system control command not execute on the host, but on any local container that is registered with machine D, right? So um, if you would normally write system control start foobar.service, you can just write um, system control dash uppercase M, um, valdo for container valdo start foobar.service, and then instead of the host, it will run in that container. The system control dash R, um, like lowercase r, uh, which actually um, works, uh, like it, it goes recursively into all the local containers, right? Normally, if you just type system control on the shell, you will see all your local services running. System control dash r will show you the same list, but will also descend in all local containers and show you the services running in them, right? So it's a very efficient way to get a complete overview about what's running on the system, regardless if it's uh, containerized or not. There's also system control list machines. Um, system control list machines will actually just show you the local uh, machines and it will show you the health status of the systemd instances running inside them, right? The health status mean, meaning um, if there is a service that failed and things like that, right? So it's, it's a very useful command if you want to know in, in one command basically what's the health status of the host, what's the health status of all the individual containers without actually looking at the individual services. Um, most of the other tools that we have in systemd, um, like login control, journal control, um, also got patched to have this dash M uh, 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 switch. So login control dash, like login control is a tool basically which allows you to see who's logged in and what seats are there, um, what sessions are there, and so on. And login control dash M just does that for any local container. Similar journal control is like the tool that allows you to, to sh uh, look at the logs of your local system. And journal control dash uppercase M then does that for any local container. Journal control dash lowercase m is even, it's actually an even cooler command. What it does for you is it will um, collect the logs of all local containers, merge them into a single stream, and show it to you on the screen, right? So um, instead of looking individually at the logs of each um, uh, uh, journal, uh, of each container, this one will actually give you a single unified stream strictly ordered by time um, that, that tells you what's, uh, what's going on in the system. It's a really, really useful command. But um, it doesn't actually just stop with systemd's own tools where the integration is. Um, there's also integration with PS, you know, the PS command, the classic Unix PS command um, that shows you the processes that are running. Um, every container that's re registered with machinedd will actually show up in PS, like there's a special column for it that will let you know which process belongs to which um, container. GNOME System Monitor has been patched the same way, right? Like you look at the list of processes and 
um, GNOME System Manager will actually let you know to which virtual, uh, to which container um, uh, process belongs. Then there are some other commands in systemd itself which are really, really useful to use. Like, for example, systemd run is a really useful tool in general. Um, systemd run is basically allows you to, to run arbitrary commands um, as a, uh, a service, right? You can, normally, you would just run systemd run, then specify a command line. This will uh, fork off in the background um, a service. But systemd dash run, uh, systemd run dash uppercase m is actually a way how you can run arbitrary commands in arbitrary containers that run locally. Then there's machine control login that is, uh, will just give you a login shell on any local container. Uh, machine control stop kind of stops any container. It's kind of obvious, right? Uh, but it doesn't stop with all these commands. It also gives you a lot of other things, like, for example, automatic hostname resolution. There's this, I, I, I mentioned it already in, in the talk yesterday for those who attended it. NSS My Containers is, is a small NSS module that provides hostname resolution so that, um, uh, yeah, any locally running uh, container that has registered itself with MachineD um, can actually, um, like, the, the name of the container is resolvable automatically to the IP address. You don't actually have to do anything for that. All that's necessary is that the container has been registered with MachineD. NSS My Containers will actually figure out the rest. Um, it's actually a really cool feature. And uh, actually, um, NSS My Containers even does more now. For example, if you use um, username spacing, I'm sure if you guys are aware of that concept, it basically allows you to, to run containers with a different set of users. Um, and if, if you use NSS My Containers, this will also now also map uh, the user IDs that you use for username spacing to useful names indicating to which um, uh, containers actually belong. So, uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't go to too much detail with that because it's very technical. Um, our APIs are also container aware if you register with MachineD. Like, for example, there's SDBus, which is our DBus API. Um, uh, like, DBus, I mentioned it yesterday, um, is this IPC system. And it, it has a call that allows you to connect to the local system bus, but it also has a call that allows you to the, connect to the system bus of any local running container. So, um, yeah, I guess, I guess what, what, what I want to say with all this is that on, on a lot of levels of the operating system, you nowadays, like, just by registering with MachineD, we expose and make the system aware of the container concept. Okay, so that was the first component, machine control and systemd machineD. The second component is actually probably the most interesting one, which is systemd and spawn itself. Um, systemd and spawn um, is the actual mini container manager that we have. The concept there is that you just point it to a directory, or to a uh, disk image, and we'll just boot that up. That's really all that there is to it. Um, it registers with MachineD, of course. Um, uh, yeah, and it's really, really minimal, but also really, really powerful. Um, you, yeah, you pass a directory and we'll boot it. Um, uh, we suggest that you put your machines in, like your container images in valid machines, but you actually don't have to. You can put it anywhere. Um, I mentioned this already. Um, it supports uh, GPT partition tables. It also supports MBR partition tables, basically, um, so that you can point any raw um, disk to it, and it will just boot it up. The exact same way how you can pass any raw disk to QEMU. Um, the general concept we try to follow there is different from other container managers in regard that we think that a container should just be like a, a system service, right? Meaning that if you run um, five containers, they should just be five system services. Um, so we call it container as a service in a way, because, yeah, it's just if you run one process as a daemon or as a service, or if you run many and call it a container, should be kind of behaves the same way. Specifically, this means if you then type system control, you should see it in the list, all the local running services, all the running containers. But it also means that resource management and things like that and starting and stopping things apply the same way to individual containers as also to the system services, right? Like, for example, if you want to say um, you bind, you want to bind um, your, your Apache service that's running on the host to CPU number seven, you can do that with a very simple system control command. Um, but you can also, in the exact same way, uh, um, bind the container um, that is running locally to CPU number seven. So. Yeah, literally, like this container as a service thing um, is actually exposed in a way that you have systemd dash n spawn at dot service. Um, to understand that, you need to have some experience with um, uh, systemd. But it basically means that uh, you have an instantiated service so that the 
that, uh, yeah, you basically have one definition of how a service looks like and then you can instantiate as many times as you like. Um, oh yeah, I actually have this resource management example here. So you have system control set, oh, there's a typo, set property. Um, you specify the service name and you write CPU shares equals 100. CPU shares equals 100 is something how you can if, uh, alter how the Linux kernel will um, distribute CPU time between services. Um, normally it's weight based basically. So um, normally every service gets the default CPU shares value of 1024. Um, and then everything that goes above that will get more CPU as everything else and everything go that goes below that will get less CPU. Um, because we set it to 100 here, it basically gets a tenth of the CPU that other services get. Um, so this is actually really, really simple and really very much the same way as you would adjust the CPU time for any system service. Okay, so much about system the spawn. Actually, I would like uh, to demo this. Um, and I hope this actually works. Just to give you a feeling how uh, um, this actually, oh, my battery is running empty. That's a bad idea. Um, so uh, let me continue talking while I actually plug in my power here. Um, what I'm going to show you is uh, actually how, where is this, the power? Um, what I'm going to show you is actually how simple the entire thing actually is. Um, so, now I should have power again. Um, so I have this, can you actually see the command line that I typed in there? Let me increase the font. Can you see that? Is that okay? Um, so what you see here is basically the, the most basic of the commands line that you can have, like the systemd and actually the power doesn't work. That's weird. I was actually. Let's see. Well, right, it works now. Perfect. Um, so what, what you see here basically is uh, the, the simplest um, uh, command line you can type, systemd and spawn dash d. The d is for a directory. Um, and then you specify a directory and that's what it will uh, boot up. So um, uh, just to show that for a moment, or oh, actually these mics work too, right? Actually put that here and talk to these mics instead. Um, okay, so what you, what we have here is actually that in varlib machines, we have a couple of, uh, uh, or actually just one, um, directory tree. If we actually look into that, what's actually in there, um, then we, uh, see that it's really just a directory tree, how you would know it from any operating system, like it has var, user, temp, sys, srv, all these kind of things that you would expect from a directory tree. And then with the command that I had already typed here, you, we can simply boot that up. First, we'll try it without the dash b. What this does, it starts the container and gives you um, a prompt in it, right? So if we look into, into this, I mean, we see there's only like two processes running. One is the bash, like the shell that, that we started as PID1, and one is uh, the command that I'm just typed, right? So this, this feels a bit like if, if you would take a Linux kernel and specify in it equals bin is h. Um, on the command line because it will just boot the system up but not actually start any init system but instead just give you the shell. So this is already pretty cool. Um, if you now look into the directory, like in the root directory, um, you'll see, okay, that's the same thing that we just saw in valid machines. Um, so far, so good. Let's make this more interesting. Now I just locked it out with control D. Um, let's actually boot the thing up. Like if we do dash B, then it basically will start a, uh, the init system the same way as a Linux kernel would start an init system when it initializes um, the system. So if we type this, then what we'll see actually, it will just boot up and give you a shell. And that's really as simple as it is. You can take any Fedora image, any of the, of the bigger distributions today, and just point them to a system the end spawn without any configuration. It will really just work. And then you can log in. And then you should not mistype your password. So, um, yeah, and there we are. Um, and then if I look into that, I have my own little system. This time PID1 is um, systemd, and it all works the same way as it would uh, uh, on the host. So, we'll leave that container here running. Um, open a new shell. Now I actually need to increase the font again. Um, if we now type the command machine control, we'll already see, okay, there, there it is, right? It's, we called it Fedora tree. 
will let us know it's a container and it's end spawn that registered it. Um, if you use libvirt LXC, if you use any of the other container managers that register with machine D, you will see them the same thing there. Um, we can actually have a look at the container um, with this. So uh, I, what I typed is basically machine control status. And what you see here is there's a lot of status information, like since when it's running, what's the leader process, what's the root directory, what's actually the operating system inside it. You will also see the unit name here, uh, the unit name being the systemd service. And you see the process tree, what's actually running inside it. And um, this is nicely recursive, actually. So um, you'll also see at the end um, the logs from uh, about the container, currently not of inside the container, but about the container. Um, let's play around a little bit with some other commands, like for example, journal control dash m, which I mentioned earlier, right? Um, we just specify a journal con oh, I need to do that as root, sorry. Um, so, uh, journal control dash m, you specify this, and then it will actually give you the, um, uh, logs of the, of the container instead of the host, right? You see that in the, in the uh, fourth column there, there's Fedora tree and not my host because my host is actually called Delta. Um, but yeah, you can use any command. Like for example, system control on the host looks like this. Um, like you can browse here through the services on the host, but you can also do system control dash M um, and run the same command inside of the container. And what we see actually here is that, oh, the power. Um, what's going on here? Oh, no, it's good. That's no, good. Um, uh, so, and what we see here actually is that, uh, yeah, Avahi failed um, because um, there can only be one Avahi instance running on the, on the system and once due to multicasting, but that's another story. Um, yeah, you can even do something like systemd run, just to give you an idea how that looks like. You can invoke, um, let's make this boring, we just um, invoke a, a, as a service Sleep 5, if I run it like this, it runs on the host. But I can also do this. And then it runs in the container. And if we then, okay, five seconds probably too quick. Let's turn it to 55. And then if we use this command again, right, we will see it, right, you see, I'm not sure if you see my mouse cursor here. Oh, we actually do. Uh, there we see this little service that was started with bin sleep 55. And that's actually really, really useful because you didn't even have to open um, a shell or anything. You can just st start programs in any local container with this lib simple systemd run thing. Um, yeah, what else can I show? Um, like machine control has a, a quite a few commands these days. I don't really want to go too much into detail what they all do, but like list is the default one, shows you what is actually running. Status shows the details about one. Then there's login, right? Like to, just to show you how that feels, um, uh, we just type machine control login Fedora tree. Oh shit. Um, yeah, there's a bug in there actually. Um, so ignore that part. Uh, yeah, this is actually something I really should fix. Um, yeah, there are a couple of other commands here. Like for example, you can can uh, uh, make sure that the container started boot and things like that. You can copy files. Um, from a container to the host and from the host to the container. You can make bind mounts so that you can mount directories from the host into the container and things like that. Um, yeah. If you um, want to see, I hope I get the, um, uh, so um, just to give you an idea, like the integration to the rest of the of the operating system. I mentioned earlier that PS was, uh, uh, has support for using this machine information. Um, here you see one command line, PS-EO, and then we specify the columns that we want to see. So I uh, um, now with PID colon machine colon arcs, uh, comma arcs, um, it will show you basically the output where it has one column of the PID, one column of the machine things belong to, and one with the command line. And what you'll see here basically is that the commands that are run inside of the container actually have yeah, the container um, uh, name assigned them. So it's, it's actually really cool. But um, let's return to my slides. Um, unless, or anybody has questions um, so far? Um, because actually, um, I really like if you interrupt me um, so that we can turn this into a discussion the way you want this to go instead of me just talking. 
But if nobody has a question right now, I'll just continue with the slides. Um, okay, let's talk about the next thing. Um, systemd networkd. Okay, now I should get this back here. Um, Hello. Okay, it does. Um, so the next thing I would like to talk about is systemd networkd. I already talked about that yesterday, um, so this will be brief. Um, uh, systemd networkd actually comes with container support by default. Uh, specifically meaning it will ship two configuration files. Uh, one that makes sure that when uh, networkd is run on the host, that every virtual Ethernet connection towards the container will automatically get a DHCP server run um, and will get uh, uh, um, like an IP range picked. It will get uh, IP mask rating set up so that from, from perspective of the container, they can have like immediate access to the internet. There's the second configuration uh, file that we ship is that when network, it only applies when networkd runs inside of a container, and it basically makes sure that the other side works too, right? So that whenever it sees a, a, a virtual Ethernet tunnel to the host, it will just do a DHCP client, an IP4L, and thus make sure that the other side works. Putting this together, if you run networkd on the host and it's inside of the container, then you don't actually have to do anything. The networking will just work. Um, I already talked about system resolve D in more detail yesterday as well. Uh, system resolve D is again this thing that um, uh, implements DNS resolution, like hostname resolution. It has actually has support for a protocol called LLMNR. Um, LLMNR is a link local multicast name resolution. It's a protocol that Microsoft um, came up with. They use it for. Um, I'm kind of repeating myself actually because I said very much the same things yesterday. So, um, but I'll. Repeat them anyway. So LLMNR um, uh, allows you to, to if, if you have uh, an ad hoc network, right, like just two um, nodes connected via some Ethernet cable, so that it allows name resolution between those two, right? In a, in a setup where you don't have a DNS server and where nodes come and go um, uh, dynamically at any time, right? System uh, system resolve D with LLMR works that way that yeah, everything that is connected to your node. Um, that knows its own host name can talk to everybody, everything else, and everything else can talk to itself all via the host names. The idea basically is that if you run system resolve D on the host and in each of your containers, the name resolution between them will just work as long as they share one um, uh, uh, direct um, uh, virtual Ethernet link. Right? Or I, actually, you can even do that across networks, but that's completely up to you. If you if you have a virtual Ethernet network that spans a couple of hosts, then System Resolve D will handle the host and resolution as well automatically for you. So the idea is basically, yeah, to take benefit of System Resolve D, you don't actually have to do anything. It will just work and just provide you with the um, host name res resolution, and you don't actually have to do anything for that. Um, yeah. So. Um, if you put this together and combine systemd network D and system resolve D, you should really have uh, um, connectivity for the container out of the box, right? You have connectivity because you get the IP layer right, but you also get the hostname layer right, so that the container and the host see each other and you can contact them by their um, actual name. Um, so much about resolve D and the container integration. Like, I mean, what's, what's important to know is that we took some software that was developed. Uh, like uh, some protocol that was originally developed um, for ad hoc networks, for like like embedded devices that talk to each other, and and small uh, uh, consumer devices, and just said, okay, it's actually really nice functionality. We can also make use of this in the container um, uh, uh, world, um, so that the different nodes, container nodes that are in a virtual network, can actually um, find each other. Um, Let's talk about systemd import D, which is another component of, of uh, what we put together. Systemd import D is actually it's, it's a very simple tool. It, is, uh, it just allows you to, uh, to import container images onto your local system and run them. I cannot demo this right now because I don't have internet here. But it's basically you just um, like it's also integrated with machine control. Machine control, like the machine CTL tool, is also client to systemd import D, not just to systemd machine D. Um, and you could just pass it in URL, and that URL can point to either a raw disk image or to a tarball, and we'll download that and put it in valid machines. Um, it does it the right way, so it will also do decompress things. It will also do GPG verification and, and simple things like that. And uh, it also can do QCOW2, like the QEMU um, uh, images. And then, uh, yeah, we'll just place them there, and you can boot them up with systemd um, uh, and spawn. Um, so yeah, it can do tar and raw, and it actually also has import-only support for Docker images. 
Um, if you if you want to play around with that, this is like how a command line looks like. You just type machine control pull raw. We turn off verification in this case because the Fedora cloud images don't provide um, uh, signatures right now that could be used for our stuff. But and then you just specify the raw disk image, and this will download the image, and uh, then you can just spawn it with SSMD and spawn dash m. So. Um, the, the key takeaway here is that we decided not to come up with any container format, but instead just wanted to make sure that um, the cloud images that the various distributions provide anyway um, just work in containers without modification, right? And then we thought, okay, then let's write a uh, minimal tool like machine control pull raw, where you just specify the URL and it does everything right, and then you can just start it. Um, this the machine control tool actually works better, ironically, on Ubuntu images than on Fedora images, even though I'm, of course, a Red Hat guy. Uh, the simple reason is that this signature stuff um, uh, is, is set up properly um, for uh, Ubuntu, but Fedora has not uh, made the change yet so that we cannot automatically do the GPG verification of the images we download. So um, that's why we have the dash dash verify equals no. Um, if you ha have an Ubuntu image, you don't have to do the dash dash verify equals no. Um, Okay, so much about the different component that we have. Um, at this point, let's do more questions. I mean, I have a lot more slides, but I'd really much rather turn this into a discussion. But nobody has any questions. There were people yesterday who had container questions. Hey, I'm back. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the 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 plans of the systemd as a project to interact with the open container project recently announcing because they say a lot of overlap of what you're doing about image verification and standards and formats. Could you comment on that, please? Um, so I'm not involved in the open container stuff. Um, uh, I, have, uh, I have seen the, the specification, um, how it looks right now. I can't say I'm not particularly happy with what they came up with so far. Um, you know, I like, that was not a good idea. Um, uh, the way I see it is basically I just want to do the basic building blocks of things. And the defining container for format is not necessarily what I think is a basic building block, right? Like that's already higher level stuff. The Rocket people did that, for example, with Rocket. Rocket has its own container um, format. And I kind of hope that the Rocket people will make sure that the specification looks good in the end. But um, yeah, right now I'm not really involved and I'm not sure I want to be involved. Um, there are lots of stuff in the specification parts that I've seen so far that I really, really didn't like, really did not like. Um, like, for example, they expose way too much information about the Linux kernel in the, in the image format that they really shouldn't be exposing. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's a good idea if they, if they become friendly, um, like, because there was this, this, like this, this conflict between Docker and Rocket. And if they can, can come up with one solution, that would be, of course, great, be great. I really hope it's going to be a good one. Um, if I look at like what Docker has done there with verification and things like that, I think it's close to being insane what they're doing. But um, I, I don't know. Like for us, I want it much much simpler and much much more low level. And hence, um, that what they do is is, is really um, out of focus for us. I mean, to make this very clear, I don't actually want to be in competition with Docker or. Rocket or anything like that. I just want to be the guy who does the low-level stuff, and other people then build something on top of that. And um, that's Rocket, for example, for us, and that's that's the way I like it. And uh, if they can deal with open containers and can add open container support to Rocket, that would be perfect because that's how I would like to see it. Hope that makes sense. Anybody else has questions? There's a question. Hi. I would like to know if there are any plans about integrating for desktop stuff. For example, using containers for dump terminals, like sharing hardware. Um, so, uh, like, what, what do you mean? You mean the device virtualization, like how you can actually have um, uh, uh, devices from the host available in the container? Is that what you were asking? Um, about running, and um, how can I explain it? For every client that connects on the server, I, I boot up a new container for serving a desktop for the user, like you can do with Windows Server, Windows Terminal. Um, 
I mean, you can do do that absolutely. Um, like like so, you want virtual desktop sessions, basically. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you you can do that. I mean, the the, the containers like how we implemented them in Endspawn are really just normal systems, right? So if you can, you, you can. Pre do that automatically. Let's spawn up a new system and then go into it via Spice or X or whatever you want to use for for a networking. But it's it's really just it is it is the same as if you would would um, start off uh, up a new system somewhere else on the uh, on this world because like the it's connect, connected via networking, right? So um, I don't know. I don't know of any uh, of any ready solution for this thing, but I'm pretty sure you can easily build that without too much work. You can just um, Start of a container, stop it after the user locked out. Um, yeah. Um, is there any further question at this time? There's one. It's probably regarding a map implementation in the kernel. Um, if I want to share uh, shared libraries between a container and the host system, is it possible, uh, or the map uh, implementation uh, does not share the same uh, the same f mappings for files? Um, I mean, if you want to share shared libraries, yeah, it's shared kinda, code. It, it kind of defeats the point of containers, right? Um, because I mean, if you share them, like like, what you want to share between host and container, or do you just want to have multiple containers using the same shared library? Well, I could use both. I could use like a share between containers and between the host and containers. I mean, what you can do, like like what what we would like to go um, towards with systemd, it's actually one of the other slides that I have, is is that we can go to a scheme where where um, you have one container tree, and then you instantiate multiple instances of this container tree, right? So that you run 100 container instances, and you use the exact same slash user. Um, for every single one of them, so that the libraries that are inside of them are shared in memory, like they will only exist once, but you have a lot of containers running off them. Um, so you can do that kind of stuff, but I mean, if it's if your question is really regarding packaging stuff, right? Like um, how like you want to be able to to use containers without actually using containers, I think it kind of would miss the point of containers, right? Like if you if you just um, run with the same uh, yeah. set of libraries as on the host. Because I mean, the, the good thing about containers are really that you disconnect um, the versioning of the libraries and the programs in the container from the versioning of libraries on the host, right? Yeah. So, but if you don't want that, then you probably don't want containers, if you follow right. what I mean. All right, cheers. Um, how much time do I have? I probably have a minute or something more. Anybody has a question? No questions. Um, so let's see if I actually have a minute. Time is it? Okay, I got three minutes. So if nobody has a question, then I'll do another slide. Um, actually, about the the stateless system stuff. Um, so I already mentioned this um, uh, in the answer earlier here. What we want to really go towards, and I actually mentioned that yesterday, I think hi, too. Hi, Lennon. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, just a question here. Where? Okay, there. Uh, is uh, when you boot the container, you start a sy system D inside the container, and how does it, does it communicate with the system D that's honey running on the host? Um, no, it does not. Like unless, like I mean, system control, like the client side, that can communicate with with any uh, uh, system D. But the system D on the host and in the container do not um, communicate. Like the system, like Nspawn will set up the environment in a way that system D in the container can work well. But it will, like they don't communicate. They just it will just set up the environment, invoke um, system D inside of container, and then it's the the. Container to does whatever it wants. And is is the system D running inside the container aware that it's running on on the container? Is that um, something that is important? No, like like so so basically, um, uh, we just I mean the, the the system D inside of the container will run in a slightly different environment than it would run on the host, right? For example, if if you run a system D on a host, it needs to do device management in these kinds of things. But in containers, device devices are generally not available, so all the device management will be disabled. Right, um, so system D inside of the containers is aware that it runs in container, 
but usually we actually don't want to hard code it in that way. What do we instead do is we check specifically for features, right? So instead of saying, okay, we behave differently in a container, what we actually do is like we behave differently in a system where device management is not available. So that in theory you could actually build a VM or something which also lacks device management and systemly would do the right thing. But um, yeah, the system the inside of the container knows that it runs in a con container and it will behave slightly different. But again, we try to not have code in system D that explicitly checks these things, but sometimes we actually have to have that. Um, I guess those were my three minutes, unless somebody here has a final question. Uh, eu gostaria de saber se tem como eu rodar um processo no container. Um, I didn't understand that, but I have this thing here. Do I have to turn this on? Mm -hmm. um, uh, posso falar? Eu gostaria de saber se tem como eu rodar um processo em determinado container e por algum motivo eu queira que ele esteja rodando com outro processo num outro container. Eu consigo migrar o processo de um container para o outro? That is a very good question. Um, like, I mean, there there are projects like Creu, like Checkpoint Restore in user space, um, that implement something like that, that you can actually serialize um, a container or just a single process and deserialize it somewhere else. I must personally say I don't really believe too much in that concept um, because it is a, you know, it's a, it's a game that that sometimes works but not always works, right? Like, it's a weird promise to make. Like, if we write software, then we really should write software in a way that we know that it will work whatever the setup is of the, of the user in the end, right? But Checkpoint Restore is something that, yeah, it works in many, many ways, uh, in many, many cases, but the, because some of the, of the functionality of the Linux kernel cannot be serialized like that, um, it doesn't work always, right? So um, I personally don't believe too much in that concept. Also, f f from the other end, you know, Containers are something that are very different from a normal host, right? Containers are something that they are very transient, very they very short-lived normally, and you usually run many many instances of them. Hence, I think it's much less interesting being able to to save and restore things and migrate things, um, because well, if you want to do migration, just start a couple of uh, new containers on the destination host um, and, and solve it that way. So. I don't know. I, I know that many people care about this, and there are implementations to do this, and LXC and things like that to support that. Um, but I'm not convinced that this is a generally useful thing, and I'm not convinced that we want to have that in Anspawn. Um, I know that that's disappointing in many ways. Anyway, I think that was really my time. I hope that an the answer was useful. Um, if you have any further questions, um, ask me in the hallway. Um, I have more slides here. Um, th I did not intend to actually cover them all, um, which is completely okay. But uh, um, I think I put them online somewhere, and yeah, if you ask me later, I can tell you where to um, have a look um, uh, on the slides. Anyway, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, I hope this was useful.